we'll just jump right in. Hope everyone's doing good. So we'll show you this specimen and then proceed with our first poll question. Okay, I'm gonna put up the question. What organ slash specimen is this? Someone said, show the inside again, please. Um, but we'll end there. It's a good spread. So as you can see, um, there's a good spread, but most people, I think, chose what this specimen is, and it's um, a nice example of an adenomyomatous um, uterus. Um, we can go through the different um, options. Um, can someone tell me why this likely isn't a gravid uterus? Here's a clue. <laughs> what was inside? <laughs> or what's not inside? Um, yeah, exactly. There's no placenta. Usually the myometrium is, um, or the endometrial cavity is, is, is much more. And really, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a, a gravid um, hysterectomy. Previous old teaching says that if you get a gravid hysterectomy, that, you know, it's most likely a medical legal kind of thing. So you have to be careful. Why not a fibroid uterus? That's right, so it's more symmetrical and, and things like that. And um, it's not like one mass that, that you're seeing. And why not a malignant uterus? Or could it be a malignant uterus? I suppose it always could. Practical example really is um, there's no ink. <laughs> so that's a, a giveaway. And, um, and finally, why is it not a, a, a prolapse uterus? What's the distinctive feature of a prolapse uterus? Yeah, uh -huh. cervix is not long, that's right. So there's that gooseneck deformity that um, we often hear about. And it's usually, yeah, mm -hmm. this distortion or elongation of the cervix. And usually it's uh, in the setting of an atrophic um, uterus, right? Because it's usually in the elder population. So you'll have a much smaller uterus. And for all those features, um, we're gonna go into um, this specimen, which is an, a nice example of an adenomyomatous uterus. Good, thanks, Carlo. So the first thing you'll notice, this is a rather large uh, uterus. I mean, you can see that it fits inside um, kind of the one palm of my hand. Um, from just a specimen perspective, this is a nice example. Uh, if we didn't have the cervix separate, but if it was uh, a specimen just submitted like this, this is a nice example of a subtotal hysterectomy or a super cervical hysterectomy. Um, in this particular case, the cervix was submitted separate, which is another indication that this was likely a, um, a benign process as opposed to something malignant because we probably shouldn't be getting these cervix separate in a malignant case. Um, and so the cervix was submitted uh, separately, likely due to technical challenges from uh, extraction of the uterus. Um, on opening, so the important part when you're opening is to take a pair of scissors or a knife, but understand where the cavity is and come down both sides laterally um, to expose your endometrium. And so you can see how the person that opened this came down laterally on both sides, again, exposing the endometrium and a similar cut can be done uh, for the cervix as well. Okay, uh, it's best to at least start with a pair of scissors and once you have a good idea of where you are anatomically, then you can kind of complete some of those cuts with a knife. Uh, again, we'll weigh it, and so this particular uterus weighed 456 grams, so just a little bit over a pound, and that's again a pretty bulky size for a uterus. You can see that it has a very bulging appearance. Uh, one of the classic descriptors is it has a globular appearance, and so you can see how round and uh, spherical it is. And assessing the serosa, 
it has a very nice, smooth appearance. Uh, there's no real kind of nodularity and some subserosal masses that you would see perhaps in a fibroid uterus. It's quite uniform, no congestion, no adhesions. Orientation wise, so we've got a fallopian tube here. I think we've talked before about how to orient a uterus using the uh, round ligament uh, anteriorly, then the fallopian tube in the middle. And if you had the ovaries, they would be hanging back a little bit. And so that's one way to orient it. But here we've only got the fallopian tube. And so we can try to look at the, um, the peritoneal reflection if it's here. And we can see here that it is indeed present. And on this aspect, it's a little bit higher than it is on the other side. And I recognize that it's a disrupted specimen, um, but that's another way you could use it. And so having that, we can probably localize that this is an anterior, this is posterior, and then this is now a right fallopian tube, which is what was submitted uh, in this case. So um, going to some of the other gross findings now, um, looking at the cervix, it's pretty unremarkable. Uh, try to get them focus. There you go. That's good. Okay. Opening of the canal. Nothing too too much going on. So we get in. Okay, so before we go in, yeah. into the inside, um, I'm just going to put up a, a poll question just to kind of keep things interesting. But so yeah, so this is an, a nice example, um, at least from um, from what we see right now. It's a really nice gross example of an adenomyomatous um, uterus. Um, so speaking about adenomyoma, let's just kind of bring it back in terms of the clinical. Which of the following is not um, a common clinical symptom associated with adenomyosis? So menometrorrhagia, so heavy and irregular menses, colicky dysmenorrhea, so painful menses, dyspareunia, pain on intercourse, dyskepsia, pain on defecation, or premenstrual pelvic pain. Okay, good, yeah. So I think most people got um, dyskepsia, which is not a, a common um, feature of um, adenomyosis. Um, so can anyone tell me something related to adenomyosis that um, where dyskepsia might be a feature, a com uh, presenting symptomatology? That's right, thank you. Endometriosis, so specifically endometriosis that's involving um, the, the, the rectum um, um, area or some kind of colonic in involvement. Um, can present with dyskepsia, but in general, adenomyosis because it's nicely confined within the uterus. You should not have any um, extra uterine type of um, symptomatology, and these are the the most common ones. So, thank you for that. So, if we can just um, continue on, sure. So, jumping in, you can see the endometrial cavity, and so that's all this kind of congested. Um, appearing looking tissue here, and then this really thick, really thick myometrium around it. And when we go to cut surface, this is what we see. Can anybody tell me in the chat what a classic gross description um, term that we would use to describe what we see here? Very nice basket weave. So you can't quite see it as well, or at least not on my screen. Is that better? Yeah, hey, it looks good. Go. So you can see how it kind of wisps and whirls around, and it, there's a bit of a pattern to it. Um, and then underneath here, where my thumb is, that's more of the regular myometrium in terms of consistency and color. And so you would describe this as this firm gray-white basket weave appearing myometrium. Texture-wise, this is much, much more firm than the surrounding myometrium, which is a little bit more rubbery. Uh, incidentally, there's a tiny little fibroid here. Yeah, so contrast it with a fibroid, although that's kind of small, right? Like um, <laughs> uh, a classic fibroid, A, first of all, it will be completely discrete, and it's not as um, um, diffuse as this. But you've got the more really white kind of world appearance, right? Versus this, this basket weave or intervening um, or inter weaving, I guess, um, type of pattern. And then from a grossing perspective, it, this is a relatively straightforward specimen. So again, you would measure, uh, docu measure in three dimensions, document the weight, the diameter of the cervix and of the os, the endometrium and its size and its thickness, the thickness of the myometrium, 
the length and diameter of the fallopian tube. You'll use your descriptors, right, using basket weave, talk about this white world nodule, this little fibroid, and um, take sections accordingly. And you probably get away with maybe six or eight sections at most with this case. Yeah, I think from a grossing perspective, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so just essentially your, your usual samples and treat it kind of in a non-malignant case, right? So let's talk about a bit of um, the histological features of adenomyosis. So um, what really is the definition of an adenomyosis in the chat, if someone can just put that down? Good, 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 yeah. So basically ectopic um, um, glands um, into the myometrium. Um, so here's a question. I don't know if there's any um, more senior residents or fives. What's the distance? How do you know that you're not just dealing with an irregular endometrium and that this was just a, a simple downgrowth versus to an ectopic endometrium, endometrial tissue in the, the glands? More than 50. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, there's actually some numbers out there of actual measurement. One centimeter, that's huge. <laughs> that's pretty big. Yeah, 0.3. So two to three millimeters from the surface is the um, often quoted number um, from the surface, um, or so at least I should say two to three millimeters um, from the endometrial surface um, before you really kind of feel comfortable. Um, some people do give that percent measure, um, but at least from what I remember from Robbins, um, the two to three millimeters is the, the one that's most quoted. Um, and again, that's an, a, a minimum number um, in terms of distance. Um, but again, going back to histology in a somewhat related fashion, I want to put up this poll on histologic dating of the endometrium. What face is characterized by the typical piano keys morphology? All right, I think this is a pretty straightforward, so I'll just end there. I think. Um, yeah, so it's usually, it's the secretory phase, so it's one of the most characteristic um, um, endometrial phases um, that can be correlated histologically um, to the post, yeah, POD day three, sure. Um, some even as early as day one. Um, so it's, it's typically early phase, right? Early secretory phase is when you see the piano keys. And can someone tell me what that piano keys really mean? What morphologic um, appearance does that piano keys? Um, yeah, subnuclear vacuoles, that's right. Um, and then eventually as you progress through the secretory phase into mid and late, that gets exhausted, it gets um, moved, and then you have these um, very secretory exhaustive looking glands. So once in a while you might see that in, in these type of settings. And then last but not least for this specimen, we talked about a relationship cousin essentially, which is um, endometriosis. But again, that's, that's more associated with endometrial glands um, being extra uterine. So this is just a... Um, Standard question, common question, what is the most common site of involvement by endometriosis? So to those studying, this is um, in Robbins and it's actually ranked. <laughs> so, and often the, the common exam question is, is, you know, name the top five <laughs> or so, um, most commonly involved sites. Uh, and yeah, so most people got it right. Um, ovary is number one. Um, Uterine ligaments comes next, I believe. Cul-de-sac comes next. And fallopian tube, surprisingly enough, um, is actually do lower down on the list. Yeah, so ovary, by far the most common um, site of um, involvement by endometriosis. Yeah, and rectovaginal pouch actually um, comes before. Thank you, Sarah.